I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ramon and Chris and Chelsea and Daniel to tell us about open topography. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for letting us uh, share our enthusiasm for topography uh, with you. And um, I want to introduce, you know, first uh, Chris uh, Crosby and I have been working together for quite some time on uh, open topography, uh, more than 10 years. And then uh, Chelsea is working with me as a research scientist here at ASU, and she's really been one of the big developers behind some of our recent updates in open topography and is an expert of, uh, of many things uh, and has a PhD from Cornell. So she worked with Rick Almendinger and uh, kind of channels some of uh, Rick's great uh, expertise, but she also works with Rowena Lohman and she uh, has a wide set of abilities. So we're looking forward to hearing from her. And then Daniel Chupik's a PhD student working with me and, and my colleagues on some East African geology, both structure and sedimentary. And he's uh, going to share with us some of the things he's been learning from the Lime software. So, um, so Chris and I'll uh, take the, the beginning part of this uh, presentation. And, um, and if I missed some things to introduce them, uh, they'll, I'm sure, be able to add. Um, Chris is working at UNAVCO and, um, and open topography and uh, has a wide range of experience in interacting with uh, especially field camps, doing terrestrial laser scanning, and also um, has done a lot of other um, field uh, teaching and uh, is a big, uh, very aware of, of also some of the latest developments in, in open data and open data sharing. And, and so he's uh, really been kind of the spiritual leader of, of open, our open topography effort. So uh, let me just make sure, yeah. So just uh, here's the quick outline we'll go through. So I'll continue this introduction and just speak really briefly about why we might need high resolution topography from remote ex field experiences. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious, but uh, we'll just remind ourselves also get a few definitions in there. Then Chris is going to talk about open topography, do a tour, looking at some of our resources that are available, and then also do a demo. Then Chelsea's going to uh, talk about some of the teaching resources we have for topographic differencing, and then show this really cool um, painted canyon folds exercise using the op data from the open topography community data space and the uh, a free software called Cloud Compare. And then Daniel has, uh, is going to finish our presentation with a demo of the Lime and V3GO um, uh, software and website and effort um, and talk about 3D mapping on structure for motion derived textured meshes, which is something we all, I think, are going to start to do a lot more. And uh, so that's, that's the plan. And so just to, to kind of a, a quick reminder on why do we need topography. So here's just one example of this really fresh. It's from one of my students uh, who was, um, he's uh, physically disabled. So he wasn't able to get out in the field with us for our field exercise in the dreamy draw part of the Phoenix Mountains, which is late Proterozoic metasedimentary rock. So we flew our drone over this area and built a really detailed 3D uh, model of the topography. And so you can see here, this is a two meter contours over a eight centimeter per pixel hill shade. And I also provided him the ortho photo. So he had aerial photography at high resolution as well. And then in ArcGIS, I gave him this little starter of the, the geology and then he mapped it from there. And we can see that uh, then also, obviously we wanted that cross section topography uh, as part of the, um, uh, input. So, you know, the, the point of the topography is it takes us from 2D and is the fundamental part that gets us into 3D. And we saw that in some of the prior demonstrations. Uh, you know, for example, the GMDE from Professor Almendinger is, is essentially using the topography uh, to do its calculations and, and many other things. We, we know we, you know, we also spend a lot of time teaching our students how to navigate on the topography. So, so this is essential. The, the real thing is, though, the revolution in the quality of the data. So, you know, many of us were maybe trained using, uh, you know, these 1 to 24,000 USGS contour maps, which have variable quality and were derived from data maybe collected in the 1950s through 1980s. 
And now we have this ability to uh, collect our own high resolution data as well as share it. And, and that's kind of one of the big parts of open topography. Uh, so I want to just uh, give a couple of definitions here. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about topography, we want to make sure we have the sense of, of, you know, the right coverage and time, space, and resolution for the question. So many times we think about global topography, which might have tens of meters to hundreds of meters per pixel, like SRTM is one thing we know a lot about. There's uh, the Marine Geoscience Data System has this combined bathymetry and topography at about 100 meters per pixel. We're starting to see some of the satellite photogrammetry get down to the high resolution level at about two meters. So here's some satellite photogrammetry from the Ridgecrest area at two meters. But what we really are talking about today and what our experience has been and probably what's useful for many field camps is the high resolution data, which is local to site scale topography at decimeters to meters per pixel. And so these data are often collected by airborne laser scanning, also terrestrial laser scanning. And then what we've seen lately is the structure for motion or a sort of return to photogrammetry from air, sort of low altitude platforms, maybe a balloon, tethered balloon, or the drones that we're all so familiar with. So the other big definition we want to talk about is the difference, you know, sort of point clouds and rasters. So, um, Point clouds are sort of the more fundamental data. These are 3D positions of the ground surface or vegetation that are sampled using lasers or photogrammetric calculations. And so you can see here on the left, this is uh, the full point cloud uh, um, from this place in New Mexico, one of my favorite places. Uh, and the upper plot so shows all the trees, which are gray, the unclassified, and then in brown, we just show the points that we think are the ground surface. And so this cross section here shows a little topo profile through this little explosion pit that's on the top of this Banco Bonito lava flow in the Jemez, uh, in the Valles Caldera. So the point clouds from them, we often then compute the rasters, which would be a digital elevation model. And it could be a digital surface model like the one on the top that includes all the points. So we see lots of vegetation. But what we're really interested a lot of times as geologists is a digital terrain model. So that's the lower plot where we make the digital elevation model from just the ground points. And so there, here we can see this really beautiful texture on the top of this lava flow. So these data are in open topography and are one meter per pixel, uh, in this case, uh, the raster, but you could on demand compute a range of uh, resolutions. Uh, and that's something Chris will show. Uh, so the, you know, so hence open topography. So it can be difficult to find and manage these data. So we've uh, been working with Open Topo for the last decade. We just recently published this paper, Zero to a Trillion, Advancing Earth Surface Processes with Open Access to High Resolution Topography. So it's kind of the last decade, our, our story of, of what we've been able to do and, and our excitement looking forward. And uh, if you are interested in a copy of this paper, just send me an email. Um, and so then we also want to acknowledge support from the National Science Foundation that's, has, that's kept us going. So, you know, one takeaway is that there's lots and lots of data in open topography, and we hope that you might be able to access these for the questions that you have. So for, with that, I'm going to toss it over to Chris. And so I will stop sharing and mm -hmm. let you go. And um, I'll be watching the chat also, so if, if people have you know, questions, uh, you can throw them in there. And then if there's a moment, uh, I can interrupt Chris and we can talk about them. Yeah, and Ramon, feel free to jump in if you want to comment on top of what I'm saying. Same thing, Chelsea, Daniel as well. <clears throat> so you guys can see my browser, okay? That yep. good. Okay. Yeah, so um, that's a good intro to Open Topo. So what I thought I'd do was a quick tour of what's inside Open Topo and sort of the resources that are available, and then um, sort of dive into a, a, a job using um, some data. So one disclosure, if you're playing, if you're following along at home, um, is we woke up to a, a systems outage on one of our servers. So um, the guys in San Diego are waking up and trying to fix that system. So certain jobs are not completing at the moment. But, um, of course, the day you're going to do the demo is the day you have problems. Um, so first of all, open topography. Um, there are most of the actions under our data tab, and I'll do that in a second. Um, but for teaching purposes, we've been in the process of redoing our kind of information uh, content and, and layout 
um, specifically around the learn section of open topography. So I'll quickly look at that. Um, we have uh, perhaps most interestingly down here at the bottom is resources for educators. And so Chelsea is going to talk about a couple of these, these recent exercises that she's developed um, here, this Wasatch differencing exercise and this Painted Canyon exercise. Um, but there's definitely a bunch of stuff here to poke around in if you're interested. The other place that has a, a, an amazing amount of content that may be useful but is a, requires a little bit of digging is this classroom training section. So this is Ramon and I and other collaborators have done something like 35 short courses over the past 10 or 12 years on these kinds of data and analysis and and uh, software and, and all that those resources are here so um, you know if you dig in there's a lot of really interesting content like this point clouds and full waveform DM analysis workshop we did last fall in Potsdam Germany is a full week of content and pretty high powered um, and so there's a lot of really interesting information here this was run primarily by Bodo Buchhagen. Um, so there's that, those resources. There's also a bunch of resources here. Um, we have a tool, what we call a tool registry, which has um, a place for people to contribute various types of software they've developed. So this is essentially a clearinghouse for various types of software oriented towards uh, topographic data analysis. Um, it's searchable and filterable. Um, you can search by license type. There's some commercial software also in here. Um, we don't discriminate. Um, and then there's some other kind of more software that we've developed, open source tools that are available through open topography and some things about APIs, which I won't talk about today. So as I said, the bulk of the action is really under the data um, tab. So this is the fine data map in open topography. And so there are every dot here, if you zoom in on the map, becomes a polygon. And that polygon shows the extent of the available data set. Um, and so there are a couple things to be aware of here. There are essentially three different classes of data that are available and they're shown in the upper right under data sources um, here. There's basically everything in red is data that's, was, that is hosted by open topography on servers we maintain in San Diego. So this is primarily the earth science oriented data collected by groups like NCOM and other groups that we've partnered with. There are some exceptions, like we have the state of Indiana's data because Indiana came to us and asked to use our system to distribute those data. Um, but a lot of the interesting geology, basically, in the Western US is covered by these data sets, things like the whole San Andreas Fault System, the Wasatch Front, you know, all these kinds of these areas. Um, a, a recent development is the green data, and this is actually really exciting. This is the USGS's 3D elevation program. So this is an, an, a, an effort by the USGS to eventually map the whole US at essentially one ninth arc second, so sort of a three meter resolution. They're doing that through um, a collaborative process with states and local agencies um, where they kind of split costs and fly aircraft and correct, collect LIDAR. And so they're slowly doing this. And as they've been collecting the data, they publish the raster topography through the national map. But the point cloud data has been sort of hard to get at. Um, and then just last year, they decided through a partnership with Amazon to publish the point cloud data into an Amazon public data set. And so this is pretty raw data, but it's accessible through the Amazon. And so what we did was we put our open topography tool set on top of that bucket of data. And so suddenly, kind of overnight, we flipped the switch and there's 15 trillion points available through open topography. It's 60, roughly 65% of the US. And you can see in this map that it's largely the Midwest and East Coast, but uh, as the USGS works through the goal of covering the whole US, more data will, will appear in that Amazon resource and then will thus appear in open topography. Um, I know most people are teaching in the Western US and the coverage out here is, is a lot more sparse, but I do know if, if there's a bunch of data sets in process in places like um, central Idaho and Montana that are coming soon. Um, probably not sufficient for this summer, but maybe next summer we'll see those data available. So the way, and then the third data sets here are these little purple dots, which are what we call the community data space. This is, these, this is designed for people who are producing their own topographic data. Primarily, we, it was designed for structure for motion types of data sets collected with UAS. These are small data sets that can be quickly uploaded through a web browser and published in open topography. Um, if you're producing these kinds of data sets and you want to share them, you can drag and drop basically into open topography. Uh, we upload, we extract some metadata, and then we give you a DOI, and the data are, are findable here. And Chelsea's going to show you a data set from the community data space. So that's kind of the overview here. In general, for these data sets, there's either point clouds and rasters available, or if there aren't raster data available, we provide tools to make your own. So what I'm going to show you is um, a spot 
um, in the Tetons um, that say you wanted to have students do a quaternary mapping exercise to look at uh, uh, you know, last, glacial last glacial maximum moraines and quaternary faulting. So there's a great example of this on the east side of the uh, Tetons. So we can select anywhere on the map. And below the map, so there's the box, bounding box I just drew. You can see there's a two, basically two classes of data here. There's a USGS 3 up data set, and then there are these um, other data sets that are hosted by open topography. So below the map, you see um, an open topography tab, and you can see there's four data sets. There's one USGS data set here, which is from 2014, Teton Elk Refuge. Um, and then there's also global data sets. So for anywhere you draw a box, basically on the map, you can get access to SRTM and ALOS World 30 and GMRT. So these are you know, not high resolution data, but potentially interesting for certain applications. Um, so I'm gonna go after this. I'll tell you right now that this, there's this one data set that was actually, it's one of the older data sets in open topography, but it's this Earthscope Intermountain Seismic Belt Project data set that was collected um, way back in 2008. Um, as part of the broader EarthScope um, effort and what was called GeoEarthScope at the time. So what I'm going to do is click here and say point cloud. Um, and I'm going to zoom in on this because I'm going to draw a small, a relatively quick running job. So say we're interested in, for those of you that have been over here to this part, it's a pretty spectacular spot in Teton National Park, Taggart Lake. And so I know from running jobs here that I can make a selection here and there's a really cool glacial geomorphology interacting with the Teton fault. So I'm gonna make a bigger selection here. Um, so again, the, the top of the page is the description of the data set. This is a 6.74 meter, meter uh, points per square meter data set. So certainly me, uh, meter resolution. Uh, make a selection on the map. The system tells me that there are 40 million points in that bounding box. And that uh, this data set has basically two classes. So there's the ground points, which Ramon showed previously. And then everything that's not ground is just classified as unclassified. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make a digital surface model, which is basically computed from all the points. So that's everything, including the treetops. Um, I won't dwell too much on this, but there, we provide various tools to construct rasters from points. And so you can do things like change the resolution of the DM you're producing. You can change the output grid format. These are the kinds of things you wanna worry about if you're gonna pull the data and say ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, there's other tools for gridding that are used a slightly different approach. This is a local versus a tin based gridding approach. Usually in most cases, the default settings work pretty well in open topography, at least the starting spot. Um, one of the cool things I wanna show you is this 3D point cloud visualization. So this allows us to look at that point cloud in the browser, which is pretty wild. Um, we're gonna make a hill shade from the raster once we produce it, and we're gonna generate it uh, also a KMZ file so we can drag it into Google Earth. So um, I'm logged in at the moment. You're not obligated to log in, but you need to at least put an email address in so we send you the results. So uh, let's go to Teton, DSM. So I'm gonna submit that. And that job is now running on servers at San Diego Supercomputer Center in San Diego in real time. So we're gonna clip out those 40-ish million points from the, data, the broader data set and produce some derivatives. Um, I see some chat. Ramon, is there anything we wanna address at this time while this job is running? Holler yeah. if there's a question you want to tackle. Um, Sorry, I was muted for a second, um, <laughs> and I couldn't grab the unmute. Uh, uh, no, Sharon was asking, especially about uh, if there's on-the-fly classification for any point clouds, and I said not yet. Not yet. Um, and so she is just uh, uh, saying that these topics uh, are of interest to her. Then there's another question about can the geotiff be imported directly into the uh, geologic map data extractor, the GMDE from uh, Rick Almendinger. And I think the answer is not quite Anya because there has to be a file format difference, a GeoTIFF versus he has these um, .flts. So you'd have to do a quick format translation, but it's something that uh, you know I think we in OpenTOPO will look at because it should be possible for us to have a, an additional format um, output. Yeah, right so, Pretty easy. We should all do that pretty, pretty easily. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know, one of those little <laughs> yeah. small links that need to be made to increase a lot of functionality. Go ahead, Chris. 
So this is job is running. Um, you'll see here that we're through the query. It's pulled out 40, it does actually turned out to be about 41 million points in that point cloud file, which is .las, which you could pull into say cloud compare or any other point cloud visualization or processing software package. Um, and this is cranking along. So what I'm gonna go do here is I'm gonna actually go make a DTM for the exact same space. So what I'm gonna do is just click modify and resubmit this job at the top and the page loads exactly as we just ran it but I can change settings. So the only thing I'm gonna change here is I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove the unclassified points. So now I'm only going to create a D, a D a grid from the ground points, which in this case would be the digital terrain model or the bare earth surface. So you notice when you do this, the number of points in the query goes down because the vast majority of the points in this data set are actually in the trees, not the ground. So we go from 41 million to 14 million just by deselecting those points. The job size gets small. So I'm gonna run that now, call it DTM and say submit. Okay, so now I've got two jobs running simultaneously. So in the interest of time, um, these will complete very shortly and send me an email. I, previously they took about less than 200 seconds for these jobs to run when I was doing tests this morning. The results when they come back look something like this. So here's the digital surface model, uh, 214 seconds to produce. This was a slightly larger job that I ran this morning. You can download the point cloud file. You can download the, the, the geotiffs inside this little tarball, zipped for faster compression for down download. Um, here is a digital surface model hillshade produced from that data set at one meter resolution. So you can pop that open in the browser. You can zoom in and see. So this is a pretty, these are these glacial moraines. Here's the Teton Fault running along the base of the range. Um, very beautiful data set. Um, we can pop that into Google Maps by popping here, by clicking here. So this loads just overlaying that image on top of Google Maps. For quick visualization, you can toggle it off and on. If you want to compare the imagery to the DSM. Um, and then we can also download the KMZ file. So before I do that, I'll show you um, what the, this is what the DTM looks like when it completes. So Fewer points, as we talked about, because we've chosen not to, to process only the ground classified points. Um, and here is the, the DTM. So again, the geomorphology is a lot more spectacular when you strip the trees off, which is what makes LIDAR so cool. Um, and so this is a really interesting opportunity, you know, as it would be an interesting mapping exercise for students to look at, say, the glacial deposits versus the faulting. Um, let me pull these into Google Earth quickly. Um, so I'll open that one. So I have Google Earth running. I'm going to pop that into Google Earth. So here we are, zooming in. Yeah, and here is hey, this. Hey, uh, Chris, yep. one thing is it's still just showing your browser. So I don't know if you just shared the oh, browser. Oh, I did. <laughs> the Good screen. point. I'm going to change that. You have to probably stop sharing and then share the screen. So you know, I'm just going to share my desktop. Thank you yeah. for watching that. Sorry. There you go. Good. OK. So there's the, um, this is the DSM, again, produced from roughly 40 million ladder points in the browser, um, or in the, sorry, in Google Earth. And then I can also bring in, um, there's the DTM also in here. And then you can do things like turn on the Q, the USGS quaternary fault map, and there's the USGS Q fault mapping on top of the DTM. Um, so, you know, this would be an opportunity for students to to pull data in, they could start digitizing just inside Google Earth. I think Steve Whitmire did a thing in this same webinar series a couple weeks ago about Google Earth. Um, a lot of interesting opportunities there. I'm gonna go back out of Google Earth quickly here because I wanna make sure we leave time for the other topics. Um, so here we go. So the other thing that's really cool about open topography is this ability to view data in the browser. So this 3D point cloud visualization is a relatively new feature. So I'm gonna click that. And what this allows us to do is pull this data set in point cloud form, not raster, into the browser. So I have not downloaded any software. I'm not running any plugins. This is just using um, WebGL. So this basically works on Firefox and Chrome browsers. And so this is the point cloud data, the DSM, for all the points. And we can look at this, cruise around, visualize. And then if you pop open this, tool on the left hand side, um, you have a lot of control over the, both the appearance, but also some other things. So let me quickly show you that. You can change our background. Let's make it sky like. Um, we can um, 
control under filters which points are displayed. So this is all the possible classifications that come with a LiDAR point cloud. Um, and I'll tell you that uh, we talked about how the points that are not ground are unclassified. So we can turn those off. And now we're looking at just the ground classified points in the browser. So you can see fault scopes much better. Um, so you can play with that. And then the other thing that's quite cool is, um, let's see. It's under scene, hold on. So scene, we can change which attribute is displayed. So right now, this is displayed by elevation, since it's some kind of color map, and you can play with what kind of color map you're using here. Um, but we can also say display the data by classification. So now points in gray are the, the, the points that are everything but the ground, and brown is the ground surface. So again, if we filter, take out the unclassified, now you're seeing, and there's some, there's some noise points in here, that's what the red are, so I'd have to change my classification. Just, oops, took off the ground. Um, so there's that, um, and then I'll just show you one more. There's a bunch of tools that allow you to interrogate these data that are kind of fun, so tools. So there's various measurements and other things you can do to the, to the, to the data. So one that I like is this uh, height profile tool. You click on that and then go to a, someplace on the data set. So what it will do is it will clamp to the topography and you can draw a profile. So we've got this pro profile in, from red to red uh, going across the fault scarp on top of one of these moraines. And then you can, if you come down to uh, scene option here, um, click on the profile. You can click the show 2D profile and lo and behold, you get, this is the topographic profile extracted from the point cloud and it shows the trees sitting on top. So if you wanted to do this without the trees present, you need to bring in the, just the piece of data that doesn't have the, um, doesn't have the, the vegetation points in it, but you can see the scarp here. Um, there, are, there are other tools here that allow you to make height measurements. So you could actually have students measure the scar pipe, and then you could talk about how old the glacial moraines are, and you could talk about you know, slip rates and other kinds of interesting things. Um, we've done this in the field um, with data that students collect using terrestrial laser scanners, but there's plenty of ways to do this just using data that are available online. And again, no downloading of data. All you need is a browser um, to do this. So um, relatively lightweight software requirements for these kinds of interrogations and explorations of data. Um, let's see what else do I have on my list of things. I think that was mostly what I wanted to show. Um, and in the interest of time, maybe we should transition to Chelsea now, Ramon? Or are there uh, questions? I see a oh, bunch of there was a few, um, <laughs> there was a few questions. So uh, one person was asking, uh, Sharon Bywater Reyes was asking about the poetry, this uh, poetry viewer and if it was possible to use on one's own data. And I said, I think, isn't that what's inside of Laz Publish? Uh, yeah, but you sort of have to run your own web server, so it's oh, yeah. it's not super uh, approachable. I think a tool like Cloud Compare is a better is a better oh, way to go. You, a, you can make these same kinds of visualizations in Cloud Compare pretty easily. That's um, a good answer. Yeah, yeah. Cloud Compare, which is what Chelsea's going to talk about, talk about. So um, is a, is a really good um, good tool, free and up to you know few hundred million points, depending on your computer, it can totally handle it. Uh, and then Dick Hairman says, can you create a one-to-one -one profile not vertically exaggerated? I don't know. I mean, you could pull these points out. You see up there in the upper right of that little profile says CSV 2D. Yeah, so you might be able to do it there. But this, I think, is just the browser, uh, you know, it's kind of squeeze as you go type of thing. Um, yeah. But uh, this, I've been really excited. I mean, this, what we've, you know, one of our big things is to go beyond the pretty pictures. And even though these are pretty, um, you know, this in the browser interaction with the point cloud really lets us take advantage of the quality uh, and resolution of these data. And other tools that are in here include measurement tools. You can measure distances horizontally, vertically, et cetera. Measure so you can measure angles on the surface. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty volume, light. Those volume calculations. Yeah, so it's nice and lightweight for, uh, you know, 
conditions where you might have difficulty with, uh, you know, different student computers and so forth. Um, but I will say uh, uh, Chelsea is going to show us Cloud Compare, which is another extremely powerful uh, tool for this kind of interaction. So um, there was a question, is it possible to save these profiles? So I think the answer, Tom, is just right there, that CSV 2D, you would do it and um, yeah, so you can export as 2D or as uh, this LAS format. You can also obviously make a screen capture or something, but um, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's transition to, to Chelsea. Uh, and um, okay. stop sharing, Chelsea. Let's right. see. And yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. Starting. You see my screen? Yep, looks good. All right, great. So today I'm going to talk about some resources that we've developed at Open Topography uh, for remote field activities. And the idea of these exercises is that students can still interact with the geology and geomorphology of a landscape, but using a computer. So as Chris showed us, these activities are available on Open Topography. You want to go to opentopography.org learn and then resources for educators. And so today I will be talking about uh, these two latter activities. The first is looking at topographic differencing along the Wasatch Fault. And then the second activity is looking at a fold near the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so in this earthquake, we or in this exercise, we developed it for undergraduate students and the idea is that they learn about faulting by looking at, in quotes, an earthquake along the Wasatch Fault. And the idea is that they look at uh, fault geomorphology and learn about remote sensing data. So in this activity, students will look at a make-believe but realistic earthquake. So here is an example of the pre-earthquake topography here is Salt Lake City, uh, here's the Wasatch Fault, and then the Wasatch Mountains. This is the post-earthquake topography, which I synthetically offset to mimic large earthquake along the Wasatch Fault. So in this activity, students use the software called Cloud Compare to make measurements of 3D displacement. This activity uh, requires a lot of interaction from the students and typically they've been quite excited to uh, do this. Material is on open topography as well as CERC and we've made a video specifically for this activity through the activity. I actually guest taught this lab at Utah Valley University and I know it's been used by at least one other instructor. So here are the example results from this lab. So here is the fault trace that the students have to map. These symbols show the displacement the students map using, calculate using the cloud compare software. The closed circles show downward motion, the, upward, or the open circles show upward motion, and the arrows show the horizontal displacement. So, the students have to determine what type of fault was activated. So normal, reverse, or strike slip. The answer is normal here, which is not surprising for the Wasatch Fault. This actually turns out to be one of the more difficult parts of the lab because the students have to consider the noise that are in their measurements. Using background in the lab, the students also calculate the co-seismic slip and then the earthquake magnitude which requires that they are careful with different unit conversions. Based on some brief internet research, they are then asked to respond to some questions about seismic hazard and preparation in Salt Lake City. So the second exercise that we've developed is this activity looking at the Painted Canyon area. So here we're going to go to Southern California. San Andreas is one of the major plate boundary faults. Painted Canyon site is located here, just to the east of the San Andreas Fault um, in the Mecca Hills area, and it is well known for its well-exposed and interesting structural geology. 
So I went to Painted Canyon with a grad student at ASU and we took a drone and collected a lot of images of this fold the surrounding canyon wall in Painted Canyon. It was really hot in the summer, it turns out. Um, and so we then came back, processed all of our imagery into, into a point cloud using structure from motion techniques. And this data set is now uh, in the open topography data space. And you can access it with this link here to the DOI. So now I will demonstrate how we can use the free or open source software cloud compared to both visualize a point cloud and to then make structural measurements. So here is the point cloud. You can zoom in and cloud compare has these cool tools to visualize and to rotate the point cloud. And because it's color, we do get a little bit more sense that we're in the field versus just seeing the topography. However, it's not hot, so maybe it's even better than being in the field. Um, and so in a few seconds, we'll look at the Compass Tool plugin. We can make uh, orientation measurements. So we'll see this uh, here, this red circle, and we can put it on these erosional bedding planes, and then Cloud Compare will compute the mean orientation of all the points in that red circle, and it then plots the pole to the plane that it finds. So you can repeat this. Pretty quickly, I would suggest making about 150 or so measurements. Measurements here are all shown in green. You can then actually turn off the point cloud and see only the measurements that we made. And so this gives us a sense of what the fold looks like. So you can export the, all the structural measurements made in Cloud Compare and then import them into the Stereonet software. And that's the result here where I plotted the poles to the planes of the measured orientations, can then contour the poles, which really clearly shows these two limbs of the fold, perform an axial planar analysis, and then uh, with that information, name the fold. Of course, this analysis could be done by hand, and we asked the students to think about the kinematics of the San Andreas fault. In particular, would you expect a fold with this orientation to form next to the San Andreas fault? And finally, the students can look at the strain recorded by the fold because these point clouds are georeferenced. So for example, we can make approximate uh, length measurements looking at one of the layers of the folds. So for example, I found an initial length of 39 meters, a final length of 21 meters. So then we can calculate the extension, which gives us negative 0.46. And using stratigraphic relationships with units that contain deposits of the Bishop Tuff, we can put a bound on the strain rate. So in conclusion, these are the two activities that we've talked about today, Wasatch Differencing and then this Painted Canyon site. And again, these are both available on Open Topography, Learn, and then resources for educators. That was great, Chelsea, thank you. We had a couple questions. One was um, back to the uh, differencing exercise. How long did it take in the, the lab? Uh, I thought it was sort of two hours or so, but uh, what's so your... The prep material, including showing students how to use Cloud Compare to make these measurements is about an hour. Um, we had three hours in the lab, which was plenty. And then the students still had a little bit of write-up of the assignment to finish. So it's and about then... two hours, but there's some flexibility. And then for Painted Canyon, that exercise, uh, we used it in the advanced structure class here at ASU, and it was just a, an assignment for like a week. Uh, you know, they turned it in, so we didn't do it live. But what's your sense how long it would take to do the whole thing? 
So the hardest part there is also actually the, also the cloud compare measurements and challenge actually is it's better if the students do it twice, at least because the first time they're going to do it wrong, probably. You mean in the sense of getting wrong little patches of clouds? Or just because you like being in the field to use that tool, you need to be careful and you need to think actually pretty carefully about what you measure. Um, so probably most students could figure that out reasonably well in about an hour. Um, and then maybe an hour or two on stereo net and then an hour of write up. Great. That was really very nice. Let's transition to um, Daniel, just to make sure we stay on time, that there's uh, time towards the end for questions. So go ahead and stop sharing, Chelsea, and then we'll have Daniel get ready to share. Go ahead. All right. Can you guys hear me fine? Yep. yep. Okay. And you can see the PowerPoints. Yep. Okay. So my name is Daniel Chupik. I am Ramon's student at Arizona State University. I'll be giving a quick demonstration on V3Geo and Lime version two software. So this is sort of another tool that we can use to view and interpret our 3D models. So v3geo.com, um, what is it? It's a public repository for viewing and sharing virtual outcrops, um, otherly known as digital outcrop models, DOMs in the literature. So it's kind of similar to open topography in the sense that it's used for viewing and sharing. Um, so what is a virtual outcrop? It's a 3D photorealistic representation of any rock exposure. This could be a cliff, a road cut, a volcano, any kind of rock. Um, so this uh, website and software, Lime Software, was developed by the Virtual Outcrop Geology Group and they are based out of Bergen, Norway and the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Currently, they have 120 models in their database which can be accessed and viewed. So this is kind of what um, the website looks like. Um, these are the 120 models that they have from all over the world, uh, ranging from clastic to carbonate sedimentology to igneous um, rocks and structures. So if we click on uh, Guero Gorge in Spain, Here's a picture of the outcrop, and then you can sort of click on the full screen 3D web viewer, and you can view 3D model in your browser, very similar to what uh, Chris was showing. And it's got some sort of tools on the side too. You can make some measurements of the thicknesses of the rock. You can play around with the texture and the lighting. Um, so it's sort of like a, a virtual trip to the, to the field from your computer. Um, so the Lime software is what you need to actually make interpretations on these models though. Um, so here's the link to the website. Um, you can download a free trial and I'll just sort of get into my little demonstration on how this all works. Oh, uh, before I do that, um, anything else you might want to learn about Lime, uh, there's a 2018 publication, Buckley et al. I recommend you check out this paper. It's got sort of the ideology and all a bunch of nice examples of what the software is capable of. So this is definitely a good resource here. So uh, I was recently in the Afar region in Ethiopia with Ramon. We were doing some field work out there and we do a lot of work with drone photogrammetry and we create our models using the structure from motion method. Um, so we took all the images from the drone and we actually use another software called Agisoft Metashape and this creates our point cloud and our, our textures. So from Agisoft to get to Lime, I exported my textured mesh as an OSBG file um, and then imported it into Lime. So if you want to learn anything else about SFM, um, there's also a link here that Chris provided. It's got a good introduction to all the concepts and some good learning material. Uh, now I'm just going to switch to this video I have of, uh, can you guys see the Lime video? No, we're still seeing your... Um, okay. Yeah, still showing just the browser. Okay. I think we are hearing your clicks on your computer, so no, no one should be alarmed. Uh, Daniel okay. has a very high performance laptop, but it, it's uh, kind of noisy at the same time. Um, 
So just a moment. Okay. Okay. Now we we oh. see your folder on your desktop. Can you see the video playing? Not yet. Uh oh. <laughs> Is it on a separate screen or? Yeah, I'm trying to. When I do the screen share, it's not showing uh, the video that I have loaded up. Is it in? Um, did you put it by chance in that? Uh, Google Drive? Yeah, it's in the Google Drive. Okay, let me just check if I can display it also. Whoops. How about okay. now? Can you see it? It says open. You have, uh, now we see Lime. Okay, it's perfect. Launching. Okay, it's working now. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. All right, so I'll start this video here. I'll try and keep along with everything that I'm doing here. So I'll give it a start here. All right, so you open up the Lime software. Uh, first thing you want to do is file. You're going to import your 3D model from Adrasoft. So it'll take a few seconds. It'll load up the textured mesh. Uh, this top toolbar, you see X, Y, Z. These are sort of like um, quick ways to change the view of the model. So here is my Golden Sands outcrop named for its beautiful color. Um, you can double click to set a rotation point and then zoom in to where you're interested in working. So here is a bunch of stacked sandstone channels, um, the conglomerate at the base. Uh, so the first thing I want to demonstrate in Lime is the use of polylines. So we're going to create new polylines and essentially you just click on whatever feature you're trying to trace. So right now I'm tracing uh, some cross beds that I can see in the sand. Um, the polyline tool is also really good for things like bedding contacts. Um, so after the cross beds, I'll draw on this contact between the conglomerate and the paleosol underneath. Uh, the nice thing about the polylines is you can edit the colors and the thicknesses. So if you're doing something like sequence stratigraphy, um, you can have red lines for your sequence boundaries, blue lines for your flooding surfaces. So this contact here, I'll make it a black line because it is a regressive surface showing the sand cutting into the soil. And then I'll also make it a bit thicker so it's easier to see. So the next tool that you use in Lime is the plane tool. And so a plane is defined by clicking on three points on the model. And so I'll try and do a quick plane here uh, measuring the attitude of this basal conglomerate. So you click three points. And then it kind of makes this huge plane. So we're going to change the width and height just to make it a bit more uh, better to view. So I've changed it to four meters by four meters here. And you have the option of having an ellipse or a rectangle as a plane. And the cool thing here, let me just pause this video for a sec. Um, it shows the dip, the strike and the dip of the plane. So this is a useful tool if you're trying to figure out uh, bedding attitude or maybe you have a fault, you can use a plane and you can figure out what the strike and dip of the fault or the bedding is. So that's a really cool feature. The next one, however, is probably the coolest. Um, it's uh, the panel tool. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import an image as a panel and I'm going to overlay it onto the 3D model. So here I'm gonna go to image file and I'm gonna open up a stratigraphic log that was done. So this one doesn't actually match up with the outcrop, but I'm just doing it for demonstrative purposes. So you're going to place the image, and like always, it kind of pastes it kind of large. So I'm going to reduce the size to say two meters. So you can see, oh, there's the digital log. It's a bit smaller. I'm going to make it a bit smaller yet, one meter width. OK, that's looking good. Um, you've got these tools here at the bottom to sort of change the orientation. And so also, you can drag and expand uh, to try and match up the digital log stratigraphy with the stratigraphy that you see on the model. There's also this trackball here you can use to translate the image and sort of place it where you want it. Once you have it sort of lined up where you think is good, you go to the model section here, right click, there's this add overlay texture. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna call this log for the strat log. 
um, we're going to do the panel is the object and we're going to overlay it onto the 3D model. So then hit OK. And then we'll just go to panels and we'll hide that image that's floating in 3D space. And there we go. Now the digital log has been posted onto the model itself. And now what we're going to do is clean it up a little bit. We're going to get rid of all this white space. So if we go to properties, um, we can set the white to be transparent and then therefore it'll only leave behind the black lines. And then there's also uh, options to sort of sharpen up those lines and make it appear better. So here I am just clicking through some options to try and make it look a little cleaner. And that's looking a little better. So you hit OK. And then I'll just rotate around and you can see that this stratigraphic log with our interpretations is actually pasted right onto the outcrop. So it's really cool uh, tool for showing your interpretations of the 3D geology. Last thing I'll show you, this V3G button at the top, these are those 120 models that are um, preloaded into Lime. You can just click on any of them and it'll load them up right away and you can start doing your own interpretations. So that uh, concludes the video. I just have one conclusion. Can you see the slideshow again? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the future of virtual geology, um, these are just some takeaway points here. Uh, we're making geology accessible to everyone. Uh, anyone with a computer can go on OpenTopo or Lime V3Geo and check out some outcrops from around the world. And not only that, if they have the softwares, you can um, start interpreting, you can make measurements, you can measure thicknesses, strike and dip, uh, you can draw on strat surfaces. And so sort of the end goal of all of this too is um, we can create sort of virtual field trips and um, this is, will be an invaluable teaching resource around the world. You'll see a lot more of it. And uh, that's all I have. All right, that was great, Daniel. Thank you. And nice uh, final uh, big thoughts there. A couple of questions came up. One was just about the performance. So uh, can you speak like if, you know, uh, how demanding is Lime to work on on your own soft your own data locally yeah it's uh it can be a bit um taxing sometimes depending on how big your model is um i forget how many points my model had i think it was something like four million points i was working with just there or seven million um you do want to have a good graphics card and processor um especially once you start drawing on all your interpretations you can sometimes overloaded a little bit um, so definitely um, to use this software you need a good graphics card and processor right and then there was a question uh, Sinan was asking about uh, is it can it work on Macs but I think it only looking at the website it's only a Windows 64 bit it's like just that right I think so yeah yeah uh, so Looks great. Maybe Daniel, one, I wanted to show one last slide. So maybe sure. if you don't mind, uh, let me come back. Uh, I just wanted to share this one slide uh, for everyone. Just there was one other paper that we wrote recently that might be of interest uh, to people, which is, you know, we did start to explore this problem of, um, of, you know, applications of high resolution topography and earth science education. And so this is a geosphere paper from uh, a couple years ago from 2017. So if anybody wants a copy of that, we'll be happy to share it. Um, and it just goes through a couple of points, uh, you know, exploring um, some of these major questions, why we want to use these data. And one of, one of the interesting things is an, a little experiment we did uh, on distractors and kind of proved to ourselves what we all know, which is that the hillshades are very nice because they don't have all the distractions like that you see in the imagery in Google Earth. And so there is something real there. And um, so that so that's there. So yeah, there's a, can we link the papers mentioned later? Yes, we can. Um, and uh, so there's just a few moments left if we assume this is an hour. Uh, so any other questions? I'm just looking at the chat. Any additions, Chris or Chelsea or? No, just to say that like, you know, the 
the cloud comparer and the lime like you could sort you could you could build models from data sets that are on open topography um, I guess that's one resource and then the other thing was that uh, Daniel briefly mentioned the Getsy uh, field resources and I think Anne posted the link to those but we can maybe post it again but there's a whole bunch of modules in there that are built on using high resolution topography and they're they're originally developed for um, use in field camp settings where students are actually collecting data using like a terrestrial laser scanner or, uh, or photogrammetry, structure from motion photogrammetry, and then doing analysis. But um, those modules are quite useful independent of the field data collection component. Um, you know, there's a, there are various modules. Um, I think Ramon just is gonna share his screen here. Jump in yeah, there. sorry, okay. I didn't mean to distract. Uh, and, and then, yeah, the, um, but I wanted to show, there are, go ahead. But so there's, there are modules on topographic differencing, uh, analysis of a fault scar up analysis of uh, an outcrop. Um, these are these are built in collaboration with uh, Bruce Douglas at Indiana University and, and others and, and are modeled on real exercises that we've done in the field. But um, yeah, so it's in here is where um, there there is the SFM link, but there's a lot of really great oh, right there. It's oh, you missed it. <laughs> uh, this one here. Yeah, analyzing high resolution topography with TLS and SFM. That module, if you look at the yeah. contents, table of contents there, so there's an introduction to structure from motion, which is really useful. It has cookbooks on how to like use Agisoft PhotoScan, um, and you know introductory slide sets if you want to lecture on what SFM is, is before you give students that kind of data. And then if we go back, Ramona, um, um, one. Oh, back to the main, this page? The main page, yeah. And then if you look at these other units, so there's a, um, a geodetic survey of an outcrop for stratigraphic analysis, it's basically what Daniel just showed you. Um, there's one on fault scarves, one on geomorphic change detection. And there's actually also like a, an engineering one, geodetic survey of an outcrop for road cut design, which is a little bit more geotechnical oriented. Um, but these are very well-developed resources that FPS has been the lead on. Yeah, and she says uh, that cleaning this up, making it even more accessible is a, a short-term short, a short -term goal uh, next couple weeks. Yeah. And I was just going to show real quick this uh, contribute the open topography community data space. This is these 75 data sets uh, that are including the Painted Canyon data set that Chelsea just showed. So this is a place where not only along with the open topography high resolution, the 300 data sets there and the thousand USGS data sets, these are uh, these very specific, often local uh, site scale surveys uh, that uh, people have contributed. And so this might be useful for people to download, to look for interesting things, but also to make your own contributions. And the question is, what would the um, contributed data sets, what would the format be? So Sharon, we have, um, so one thing is we, we think we do a good job on the sort of data management and the metadata. Uh, you know, we know where it is, but then depending on what you upload, uh, you, could, you could just give us the point cloud, sorry, show data files. So right, in this case, LAZ file, but we'll also take geotiffs of the digital elevation model and the ortho photo. Yeah, last, so basically LAS or LAS for point clouds, geotiff or IMG for raster products. And if it's SFM data, you can actually upload the source imagery. So, um, you know, the JPEG images that came off of your DJI drone or whatever. Yeah, and coming from Cloud Compare, you can save as LA, LAS. So no problem there. So uh, we wanted to be sensitive about the time. So maybe uh, we just want to thank, uh, thank you all for listening and, and thank Chris, uh, Chelsea, and Daniel for their really nice contributions today. And um, I'll turn it over to Anne or, or Basil um, for any final remarks. No, I thank you all. I think it's the comment have indicated. This has really been great. Um, it was really well done too. So thank you all for coordinating that. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Yeah, thank you all. And, and yeah, we'll see you all around. Um, but yeah, anytime, if you guys have any questions, you know, we, we're here to serve, you know, open topography is something we are all, you know, really, we love doing this and, and sharing our enthusiasm. So if people have ideas or questions, just send us an email. We'll be happy to help and, and work together. All right, so thanks everyone and, and uh, keep in touch.